Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Hanley, I'm Navajo. I'm from Wind Rock, Arizona, and I manage public programs, membership, and public um, relations for the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. Um, again, as Alicia said, my entire career has been guided and dedicated to the work of contemporary American Indian artists and um, the American Indian fine art field. So we really want to thank the Indian Arts Research Center at the School for Advanced Research for including MOCNA in its 2014 speaker series. So um, as we, as um, Alicia just discussed, I wanted to welcome you to this panel, Sharing the Creative Spirit, Indigenous, indigenous Community Art Projects. Um, since you already know what we're kind of going to be doing on this panel, um, I want to talk a little bit about what I think about these, um, about about community-based art projects. So basically, um, I think community-based art projects refer to an artistic action ground in a community setting. Um, projects from the genre of, um, can be of any kind of media and are categorized by collaboration or dialogue with the community. In some cases, members of a local community will come together to voice concerns or issues through an artistic process. Community art projects um, can take the form of political and social activism, and activism often takes on specific and sometimes surprising forms. With that said, the medium and the material of this type of work um, are connected to human relationships and sometimes don't have anything to do with social activism at all. Sometimes it's just about the process and just about the art. Often artists work in partnerships with people from a community who may not otherwise normally actively engage in the arts. Um, these communal artistic methods act as a catalyst to trigger events and changes within a community or even at a national or an international level, as we're seeing. Personally, I understand the impact that community art projects can, ha can have because, yes, I was a child of community art projects. In the 70s, both on the reservation and urban Indian settings created opportunities which allowed and encouraged me and others um, to tap into our intrinsic um, creativity, whether it be performing operas or ballets on the Navajo Nation at the Window Rock Library or handing me a 40 by 36 canvas to paint what culture meant to me at the Pascual Yaqui community of Guadalupe, Arizona, where I went to elementary school. These projects... Um, these community projects supported ultimately who I am as a community member and an arts administrator. Those that created those programs, wrote those grants, taught and led me when I was nine and when they were in their 20s, became the force behind the creative community that I still work with and or who are my bosses when they were in their late 30s. These are the people who built the arts community in my hometown and continue to do so. Community art organizi organizers have great enthusiasm and passion. They understand the inspiration of standing before or behind magnificent projects, creations of aesthetic and cultural value, and pressing issues. They encourage community building and important relationships. These community builders indeed have the ability to convey the fire in others, both native and non-native. And ultimately, these projects can reveal something surprising and beautiful, which can emerge. So oh, I want to thank you all for being here today, and I think we should probably get right to talking about your projects. So at this point, I probably would like it if maybe we start with, um, with the women, and if you'd like to talk a little bit about your project. Hi, bonjour. Um, I'm sharing my spot with Sherry because the two of us are on this project together. We're on the National Collective of Walking with Our Sisters and we have, so we've split our time, which is five minutes we've been told. So I have two and a half minutes and she's got me on a timer and so I have to talk pretty quick. And, but she, she has a, a set of skills uh, that, uh, and I have a set of skills and we tend to complement each other really well. And things that I forget to talk about, she'll definitely pick up on and vice versa. So Walking With Our Sisters, um, as you've heard, is a, uh, it started out as a social media project, but it really started out as a reaction to the loss and grief that's being felt within our communities uh, across Canada, across North America, for the loss of um, our sisters who are being murdered and who are missing. And um, there's a lot of protests that go on uh, north of the border um, yearly, there's many vigils that go on, and, and when we are on Facebook, you see a lot of the posters uh, monthly. 
sometimes weekly, of uh, women going missing. And it's like um, holding a collective grief uh, among the communities that we share. And um, so out of that, the project started. And I put it, the call out on Facebook for moccasin tops. And within a couple weeks, there was um, an overwhelming response. It was like it just snowballed. So a lot of people felt that they wanted to contribute to it by making a pair of these. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then we would show them. But it wasn't just a matter of showing, because walking with our sisters is not an exhibit. It's ceremony. From the very beginning, I went to one of our elders, and I gave her tobacco. And I asked her to guide us in this to make sure we didn't breach any traditional protocols, um, to make sure that we were following the things that we needed to follow, because we're dealing with people's lives, with their grief. And we had to make sure that everything that we were doing was in accordance to the way that we're, that, that in our traditional ways. So out of that, she told me what to do. And, and because of that, we set it up in each space as a memorial. So if this, if walking with our sisters was in this space, for example, what you would see during the installation would be very first of all, the space would be smudged out by the elders. Then there would go down cedar or sage, which is what we use in the north, um, underneath the cloth. And then the entire floor space would be covered in cloth. And on this cloth, there would be a path that would walk and meander through. And then the moccasin tops are set side by side, as if the women are standing in their moccasins, shoulder to shoulder. The moccasins are not sewn, the tops are not sewn into moccasins intentionally to represent the unfinished lives of the women. It is a community project in the most truest sense because we have people who are grassroots people. We have families who have been affected by this issue. We have uh, contemporary well-known artists. We have everybody coming together, literally thousands of people coming together and doing this project. It's going to run until 2019. Where am I at? Am I over? I'm over. It's your turn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's it. The installation is now in its fourth location. It's, it opened in Edmonton in October, went to Regina, went to Perry Sound. One of the things that's happened is people haven't wanted to let it go. Um, and that we didn't, we're not using art shipping, for example, um, and that people just, it didn't feel right packing all these things up and sticking them on an art shipping. So people are personally driving. Um, you know, 30-some boxes. So people are hand, handing them over, like handing them over. So when Perry Sound came, we had a, a feast at Thunderbird House in Winnipeg. And then we began installing. And in order to, even just to install it, you have to have mobilized a really large group of volunteers because it was, oh, I don't know, nine, what we do, four nine-hour days to install. It's a huge job to install. Uh, over 1,700 moccasin vamps and to prepare this space. So what it's been for Urban Shaman, of which I'm on the board, it's, um, well, it's been a couple of things. As a citizen of Winnipeg, it's brought groups together that address this issue. Uh, it's brought us together around one circle. We had four large community meetings um, and, and have all these shared plans about how we're going to use the installation to move us forward. As a board, it's brought us, it's brought our gallery, it's brought people into our gallery who have never been there before. And in three days, just to give you an example of the impact that this has had, in three days we've had 500 people come through. We opened Friday at five to the public. There was a private uh, viewing um, for the families. Um, so um, we wanted to give the family members a chance to walk through the installation without sort of anyone looking at them. Uh, and then open it to the public at five and then had a feast um, off-site. And I was talking to someone this morning, I said, how many people have walked through with 500? So it's, it's, you know, connecting with community on a really broad sort of multiple levels as makers, as installers, but also reaching out um, because of really of this issue that affects us all. Pretty good use of time. Tanishikiwa, Nimuyan, Dishinikashon Dillon, Nimishun Teposh Michif, Teposh Temesiwak, Dillon Minor, Indishnakas, Anishinabe, Indonjaba, East Lansing, Inda, Otebemesiwak, Indodan. 
Um, so uh, I'd like to thank Andrea and Alicia and Daniel for organizing this. And of course, you know, it's, it's often protocol in these sorts of things. Kind of thank whose territory or think about whose territory we're on. If I'm correct, uh, Santa Fe is actually kind of Pooge, uh, is at the right uh, place of the white water shell, um, if I'm correct there, but I could, be, uh, I could be incorrect. But just think about these things. Um, today I'll be talking um, primarily about a project I've been working on, which was initially funded through uh, NMAI, National Museum of the American and Indian, a project called Anishinaabem Sao Ebshkigawag, which in the Anishinaabem Win language means Native Kids Ride Bikes. And it's basically a project uh, engaging with uh, uh, lowrider bicycles. Um, I grew up in Michigan. My family comes from kind of, kind of throughout the, the Métis Nation homeland from, from the Drummond Island, kind of uh, Great Lakes Métis folks um, westward. Um, but I've always, I grew up in, in Michigan in a, a Chicano farm worker community. And so much of my work and intellectual work engages kind of uh, shared experiences of colonization and shared experiences of indigenous and kind of presumed uh, metisage, mestisaje, and ways of uh, decolonizing that. Um, so the, the, this project, Anishina uh, Bensa Bimsko Ebshki Gawag, uses the, um, the vehicle literally and metaphorically of the bicycle to engage with youth, urban native youth, oftentimes removed from their home communities, um, to think about sustainable transportation, to think about uh, the teachings of the elders, to think about uh, stories, and just to, to think about health. So initially, um, initially I, I did a, a workshop. Uh, my partner runs an organization called IEP, the Indigenous Youth Empowerment Program, which runs an after-school program for urban native youth, as well as a summer camp. And with, with uh, participants in that, in our community, um, Basically, we built a series of seven bikes based off of, uh, which in the Great Lakes are known as the, the seven grandfather teachings. Each of the bikes, bike, each uh, single bike became one manifestation of each of the teachings. We brought in elders, fluent speaking elders. Um, in Lansing, uh, where I live and, and teach at the university, we have one of the largest uh, fluent Anishinaabemwin communities in the states. Um, I read an article in Indian Country Today that said that there's 100 fluent speakers in Michigan, Wisconsin, and North Dakota, and by our estimates, there's about 50 fluent speakers in Lansing. Um, so you have about half of the fluent speakers in the, you know, in the Great Lakes, Nishinaabemwin speakers outside of Minnesota living in an urban setting. Um, many of them came from Manitoulin Island, which is on the Canadian side, has six reserves. Uh, many of them come from Wiki, Wikemekong. Um, and so because it's Manitoulin's the world's largest freshwater island, it, it's, and many of the, the, the reserves are unseated, uh, language fluency is vibrant there. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, many of these folks were recruited to Lansing to work in the auto industry. Some of them laid down roots, and now you have second, third, and sometimes fourth generation urban native folks from the other side of the border. So working with uh, the fluent speaking elders, with the youth, we built these seven bikes. Uh, since that time, I've done workshops, I create workshops, I see the project as a facilitation. Um, I'll do workshops, create the space, and work with uh, youth to build bicycles, sometimes based on uh, ideas and, and concepts that I come in with, sometimes if they're longer and the community is more comfortable with me, um, you know, we'll develop them kind of in collaboration, in, in conversation. So I've built a, a few dozen uh, in, in working with urban and reserve uh, communities in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, right now, Anishina Ben Sabim Skoeb Shkigewag is touring. It'll be at the University of Minnesota Museum of Art uh, in the fall. And four of the bikes are part of Beat Nation, which is a, a, an exhibition traveling kind of many of the main institutions in Canada now looking at hip hop and Aboriginal or Indigenous culture. Um, I also work on a variety of other projects, which if I get time to talk about, um, which are very much about uh, what you know, could have at one time been called community-based arts, what during the 90s uh, Nicholas Borio would have called socially or, or, or relational aesthetics. Uh, the, the, the critic Claire Bishop published an article in Art Forum which critiqued that and kind of looked at that, the, the tension between eth uh, aesthetics and ethics, um, challenged uh, relational aesthetics, but have subsequently been called um, things like socially engaged art, um, that's what uh, Pablo Alguerra, uh, the artist, uh, calls it, and then um, Harold Fletcher calls it uh, the art of social practice. So my work kind of involves community collaboration, oftentimes working with communities in conversation uh, to work on projects. 
Um, I have one uh, I did this fall, which was an installation, and I investigated and made these uh, risograph published uh, publications. I grew up in zine culture and punk rock culture and made uh, kind of that aesthetic influences me. But there's a site in Flint, Michigan, which is kind of one of the uh, known as for, for known as one of the most violent cities, but it used to sit on uh, on territory that was uh, signed in treaty in the Treaty of Saginaw, but has since gone out of out of in, uh, native hands. And so I uh, made a publication and a video about that specific site. So my time's up, so I'll pass the the mic on. But I can continue to talk about this and some of the other socially engaged projects that I'm engaged in. Thanks, Tom. Doug. Well, I'm, I'm really um, honored and humbled to be here with all these. Um, really impressive artists, and uh, I read a lot about the, the Sisters Project online, and it's kind of nice to, to see her with them. Um, well, I made, um, I've been making art like about 25 years, and about 10 years ago, my son's like 25, 24, I went to the mall with my son, and he wanted a skateboard. He said, Dad, I need a skateboard. And I was like, uh, well, I don't, I pull out my wallet and I was like, that board's like $55. I was looking in there and I was like, and I was like counting my money. I like, I literally had like $24. I said, I can't afford that one, but I can get you that one. It's blank and I'll paint it for you when I get home. He says, okay, dad, I just need a board. It's a good boy, right? Like he could have complained. He could have <laughs> do a fit, right? He said, it's okay, dad. I just need a board. So I went home, I painted it. I live in San Carlos. It's like two hours from Phoenix and I had a bunch of paint markers from Walmart. So I painted a little warrior on there, and that's basically what I call Apache creation story. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> From there, I just got off the phone talking with the woman at the Peabody Essex Museum about the work I did with iPath footwear, designing skate shoes. Uh, that's not, that's pre-Nike native, uh, by the way. And I also did a line of clothing for uh, Volcom, Volcom Stone, which is also pre-Paul Frank, by the way. <clears throat> and Volcom did not do anything rude or racist to work with me either, by the way. Just that I throw that out there. They were actually the opposite. Um, but getting back to, the, to um, uh, working with uh, Doug, and I took the skateboard to the second one I painted, because I knew, I knew what was going to happen. I said, what happened, son? Because he was gone all day, and he said, Dad, everybody wants one. So I began to think, about how can I get this art into the hands of the kids in the community? What a lot of people don't know is, even before I started Apache Skateboards, I worked for about 10 or 15 years in the field of social work in San Carlos. But nobody really knows that. I was a um, prevention counselor and things like that. And, <clears throat> and I was always using my art in the community. Like, I was hired by the tribe to create public art, but uh, like for pamphlets and booklets like this. So I was already using it in the public. And so when he's talking about social practice, that's really kind of what I'm doing as art, as social practice. With, but I wasn't really trying to make it social practice. But once kids take your art and they put it to use, then it becomes sort of some type of social practice. But I didn't know what that was until I actually came across an article about it. I was like, oh, that's what I've been doing all along. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> so, um, and that's kind of like the genius, really, of Apache Skateboards. It's what I call accidental genius. I didn't really know. All I knew is my son was riding a skateboard. He needed one. But... But I was really turned on by the art on the skateboards. I was really, like every time I went to the skate shop with him, it was like a small gallery. And I was like, I was looking at that art and I was like, wow, I was like, these guys are painting whatever they want. So from here on out, I'm gonna paint whatever I want. <laughs> and I did, and I'm not saying that, how many down the time? Okay, I got three minutes. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> you can come together in social practice and also come together with a market. You can, it can happen and art. These things can all overlap. It's not mysterious, but um, it's important for the, the art to speak for itself and the work to speak for itself. Um, and that's all I really wanted to do is let the work and the art speak for itself in these past 10 years. I just closed the show called Apache X, 10 Years of Apache Skateboards, which is kind of like a little retrospective. And I'm not done, I mean, we're still doing it, but... <clears throat> Letting the art speak for itself is, is really important. Um, because when I look at, like when I'm thinking about the art that the sisters are doing and he's doing and I'm doing or any of you are doing, whether it's music or painting or murals, I say if it's in the community and it becomes part of the community and we're speaking to a community and it's for the community, then there's really no difference between me and Stevie Wonder. 
There's really no difference between me and Marvin Gaye. There's no difference between you and Bob Marley because these people came from specific communities and talked about their community in their art. There's no difference between you and Bob Dylan. There isn't, except because he's coming from a community and a communal experience talking about uh, a dysfunction within society that needed to be addressed. And that's what these sisters are doing. There's no difference. But it, over time, though, it's, it's become labeled and it's become pigeonholed and it's become boxed and it's become all of this anthropologicized, ethnographized, Native American da-da-da. But in reality, it's about us and talking about loss and, and winning and pain and suffering and joy and creation and recreation. But when I say it's no difference between me and Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye and Bob Marley, I mean it. If Stevie Wonder can stand up and say, I was living for the city and we were poor and we didn't have much, but at least our clothes were clean, that's legitimate. That's a legitimate statement about his culture and where he's from. And then the, the, geni the, the interesting genius marketable part of it is he sold millions of, these, of this picture of his life. If Marvin Gaye can stand up and say, hey, what's going on? This city life that makes me want to holler. To me, it's no different than what you do in your art and your poetry with your guitar, with your paint, with your canvas. It's no different. It's just become something different, but it's not different. Or Bob Marley saying, hey, I'm from Trenchtown, man. And uh, to me, there's no difference in what I do and what they do. Um, it's just that nobody knows who I am. <laughs> and, I'm not, and I don't make millions you know, off of uh, records. But the power in the artistry um, is there, and that's really what I like to hear about hearing their story, is the power in their artistry. And it's, I think the more they do it, um, the bigger it becomes, and the more powerful it becomes. And it'd be interesting to hear about some of their um, people, the way they probably were criticized. I bet these women were probably criticized at some point. Thank you. Thank you all for talking about this project. They're all really wonderful, and they're all different in their own different way. And um, I, when we were uh, working on um, how we were going to structure this, um, we decided that each one of the panelists would take a specific question and kind of focus in on it. And then if the other panelists had things to kind of say, they would jump in afterwards. So these are for the women. Um, can, you, can you talk about the impacts that walking with our sisters have had and, and your successes and, and, and things that you think are important for, for us to hear about? Um, I think that one of the sort of phenomena, if you will, mm -hmm. of walking with our sisters has been just seeing social media transform into face-to-face -face mm -hmm. engagement. Um, it initially started off asking artists to create vamps for this project and many did. Mm -hmm. But then sort of one morning, mm -hmm. there was a little post on the Facebook page that said, I can't bead, but I really want to participate. Mm -hmm. And then a response that said, where are you? And from there, I think it was then Jamie Coble did the first one in Ottawa. So then Jamie Coble said, OK, you can come to my house, to my kitchen. And so it was really going from engagement on a Facebook page to basically face-to-face -face engagement with complete strangers mm -hmm. around your kitchen table. And really, the f we didn't know until the, the last, really, how many were going to come in. But mm -hmm. over 1,000 artists being motivated to create work, 50% of those people had never beaded before. Mm. Like 50%, that was like 65 beating groups that sprang up all across the country. And let me see the music I was checking. Ah, oh, these are my stats. So we had, um, yeah, seven Haudenosaunee beating circles from New York, Quebec, and Ontario. Uh, 13 beating circles in post-secondary institutions, including universities, and IAIA had a beating circle, galleries and mm -hmm. museums, community organizations, and many, many kitchen tables. So in Winnipeg, I mentored two beating circles and then plus participated in two others. I think that mobilization of people, and, and it was 
um, just in kind of response to Doug's last comment, it was one of those things where for a lot of times people wanting to engage with this very critical issue through art, there's been ethical issues that would, would stop you from doing that. And one of the things about this one, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, really, except for maybe it's the act of beating in itself, and what beating as devotional labor is often for people, and what moccasins are, and what they often mean to us, and at least where we're from. You know, you get your first moccasins when you're a baby, and you get a new pair when you leave this world. Mm -hmm. You know, so that idea of the, the importance of moccasins. But growing in, like, where, you, where I am, um, you would be living in a community, and it would be like being those ducks in a... What do call those play carnival? You know, those little ducks mm -hmm. that disappear? That's what it feels like to be a Native woman. Uh, you know, just poke someone else gone, poke someone else gone. Oh, 10-year-old girl taken out of her house. Oh, university student walking home from a party at 3 in the morning. Bang, you know, just the elder at my university's granddaughter, poke, gone. You know, it's just... And you feel so overwhelmingly helpless mm -hmm. that there's nothing you can do and somehow, making these vamps empowered us as individuals and gave us something to do. And it's also leading to other kinds of actions as well, other collective actions. And to me, on the opening night, the thing that I mean, and I don't know why this is sort of, maybe says more about me, uh, but we tend to th feel as women that this has become a woman's issue as opposed to a community issue. And the number of men that came really surprised me, the number of men that came on opening night with their sons. Mm -hmm. Because you, when you walk through the space, I mean, some are made by five-year-olds and it has like little scrawling, I miss you. Mm -hmm. And others are like incredible three-dimensional Haudenosaunee beadwork that just, you're like, oh my God. And you, you have these reactions where you're simultaneously moving between awe at the expression of love by all those, by that more than a thousand people, the beauty of the vamps, mm -hmm. the content of them, because there's content there to look at, and then just s getting set back by the overwhelming representation of what you know, that space is physically representing. Mm -hmm. I think being able to mobilize that number of people is, has been extraordinary. Christy? You asked about success, mm -hmm. and it's such an odd question because I, um, I'm not one to ever even care or consider about <laughs> the word success. But um, the way I measure, I would measure success with this project is not looking at a big picture, but by all the, un -little, by all the unspeakable little moments that are happening at these mm. spaces. In each community, a community council has to be formed in order to organize to make sure that this can happen because it's such a huge undertaking. And part of the instruction that we got from our elder was that there must be elders from that region who sit on the community council and that those elders are not just there as token elders to open up with an opening prayer and then everybody else takes over. They are there to provide guidance and that we have to listen to what they say throughout, throughout the exhibit. So this is how we bring in ceremony into it and the elders and the keepers, Sherry is one of the keepers now in Winnipeg because there have been sacred items that have brought to the bundle of the vamps um, that travel and, and those need to be taken care of and the teachings passed from keeper to keeper in each site, which is why people feel a real um, need to drive everything from site to site rather than ship, ship the work. And so when you enter the space, it has been set up as a lodge. And when you enter that space, you feel that, that what, whatever that is that you feel when you walk in there is like it's you're walking into a sacred space. So every, everything shifts within you. You have to remove your shoes to walk around to view the work. It's, it's quite, um, like Sherry was saying, you, you go from, you know, just overwhelming, recognizing the beauty and the love and the care that everyone has stitched into their beadwork and you feel that energy when you walk in there and then you get overwhelmed with the sheer numbers because out of the, you know, we don't, I don't know what the stats are in the States, but in Canada, the current stats of the last 40 years are 824 Indigenous women and girls have gone missing or have been murdered. And, um, and so out of the vamps, there's, just to put this in there, there was 333 pairs that were made by artists in the States. So it really is we're trying to make it North America wide and it will be coming to Santa Fe here too. So for me, the measure of success is in the little moments, the little moments like in Perry Sound, one of the keepers said, 
she, it, it's, a, it's a, a white town with some conflicts with the nearby, um, you know, co Anishinaabe communities. And they felt that kind of tension in the, in the town all their life. And they go in and they have this exhibit. And yet here is this older non-native gentleman coming in volunteering and he's teaching another person about tobacco because he had been taught about it. And it's like with this openness and this open heart and creating these bridges in the communities and beating groups that are continuing even after people have left, uh, even after the vamps have been put in, they're still continuing to bead together. And there's all these kind of little, little things like a, a Métis man in, who never smudged before said that he was discouraged to do that all his life by his family and his community that was very strongly Catholic. And he said, I'd like to try it. You know, and it's these little moments, these little moments of family members coming in and saying, I didn't know that vamps were made from all nationalities yeah, and more. getting very teared up. You know, it's, it's those moments. It's the moments of success are measured in how, we, how successful we are in doing the honoring because it's the process of honoring at each and every site that is really what it's about. It's not about how many vamps, or it's not about you know, the visuals about it. It's about the process of the ceremony and having the audience be part and parcel of that ceremony coming into that space and, f and sending up prayers with tobacco, all of us, and trying to create that, doing that honoring, recognizing the women's lives no matter who they are or where they came from, that their lives have value and that their lives continue to have value to the people who are missing them. And, and that is really the, that is what the whole project is about. And that's why it, it, uh, it's, it seems to be resonating with so many people because we aren't measuring it by any, any other kind of standards of success other than how much are we respecting the lives of the women and the family. And that's about it. That's wonderful. Can, um, I, can I add a little? Bit sure, absolutely. Okay? absolutely. I, was, uh, I was just thinking that uh, the summer camp that the IUP Indigenous Youth Program does in Michigan, they all made FAMS last summer. None of the, the kids didn't finish them, they took them home and kept them, but it was uh, the instructor who's from, uh, from Wiki, uh, from Manitoulin Island, kind of was inspired and she sent her VAMPs in and so the kids were engaged in this, in this process. So I think that's, I think, these connections that exist, even for folks that didn't send it in, right, and engaging in these practices of beating and, and, and thinking of these histories and these stories and, right, it happened, my kids were involved in it and just sitting on a panel with the two of you, you know, I thought, oh, I better do some beating. So the whole, the whole <laughs> if you followed my Facebook, it, uh, uh, in addition to saying, oh, I'm stuck at this airport, I was spending the whole time beating, partially because, right, I, I was, uh, feeling intimidated and like, oh, I need to, to, to kind of engage in the, the, this practice and this process. And so I think, I mean, it has this very important element to it, um, dealing with uh, missing and disappeared women. And it also has this uh, reclamatory, if that's even a word, this, the, the, this, this process of re reclamation and of pedagogy and teaching, where if half the people had never beat it before, right? I mean, that's, that in and of itself is pretty significant. Um, thinking of success, um, I've worked, uh, so, so that's a question I've actually been thinking about in relation to the bikes because I work with a friend of mine who, who travels and does uh, youth suicide prevention throughout Indian country. And so we've collaborated on various things and he comes from a social worker background. And so he wants to, in terms of kind of working with this project, write it into grants which have these elements of trying to have some tangible quantitative and qualitative kind of uh, modes of assessing it, and I'm always very, kind of very like, oh, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that. But maybe, maybe in, in an, I mean, just measuring how many exhibitions, this is what, book through 2016, 2018, I was just on the website yesterday. Um, 2019. 2019. 2019, right? Um, yeah. um, you know, I was talking with a colleague at my university who, you know, who's trying to bring it in sometime in the next few years, right? So it's, you know, I think that in of itself, just how many, how many different spaces from, you know, uh, a space in Perry Sound, a, a non-indigenous community to like the Zeebwing Center um, in Michigan, which is a, a Anishinaabe uh, cultural center museum. I think those uh, speak to the success of a project like that. Should I just say anything or? 
I just, uh, it's just an amazing project. It, it reminds me um, a little bit of, of the NAMES projects, the AIDS quilt project, and the impact that it's had on so many different people. I think at this point, there's over 48,000 blankets that are a part of that project. I hope that it's not going to be, I hope that we're bringing so much to what you're doing that some of these atrocities will stop. But um, gosh, what a wonderful, amazing project, and so many facets to it. It's, it's, it's really, really wonderful to think about. Um, and on that note, I want to go now to uh, Doug and your question. So your question is, um, how, how do you engage and collaborate with the community? Um, what, what role do community members play in determining the outcomes of your projects? Because I've, I've known you for a very, very long time, and you've always had sort of an entourage um, of, of people who are doing things and, and skateboarding and painting and, and creating all around you all the time. And it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Um, so I, I kind of want to hear what you think about how that works. How do you collaborate with these folks? How do you, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to see um, when, when you've watched um, Doug. And, and like I said, Doug and I have known each other since we were like in our teens, <laughs> which was a very long time ago. <laughs> All right, <laughs> seems just like yesterday. <laughs> that's a that's a kind of an interesting question because I, I had thought about it, and the question again is, can you give me the how Twitter you, version? How do you how do you engage? How do you work with people in your community? Oh. How do you work with all those all those uh, young artists that you're working with? All those skateboarders. How do you? What do the role of those of those um, folks that you work with? Um, how do they how do they how do they determine the how how you do these projects? How do they work within these projects? How do, they, how do they contribute? I think what happened, at least for me personally, first is I started to see, like once I created the, the, the brand and then I started creating the skateboards and I started giving them away, which all took place like within a year, less than a year, once I did that first skateboard, it took me a while to figure out all the logistics, like where do I make these and how much does it cost and how can I save the money, all that. But once I started giving them to the kids, I started, really looking at these kids and it was like watching a film I started looking at them like I started seeing the power and the beauty in them and, and it's just really raw it's really raw power and really raw beauty I wasn't looking at them in like over photoshopped way I wasn't thinking about how can I pimp these kids out or uh, how can I get famous how can I get known I really was looking at the raw beauty and power of what they were doing with very little and how once they took the skateboard, they kind of like, they were just like super stoked. And I was like, man, these kids are beautiful. And it just, and, and every day, and so even at that, I was taking a lot of pictures at that time too, and I still take a lot of photos. And so, and what it was doing was kind of inspiring me to no end. And so over time, what I was realizing, and I've always said this before, I always tell people, when you're an artist, to me, this is, especially as, as a native artist, uh, as an Indian person, I kind of think like native people, at least for me, I first made art for myself. And then I, if you have kids, then you kind of make it for your kids. If you don't have kids, it's brothers and sisters. Because you're going to show it to somebody and say, oh, what do you think? And then you make it for your, your family. And then you make it for your community. And then you make it for the world. But that's the way I kind of started seeing how I was making art. Because I looked at it first, I was like, yeah, this is rad. I like it. And then I'd show my kids and they say, oh, that's cool, Dad, or whatever. Or, no, I don't think it's that cool, Dad, and, or, or whatever, right? <laughs> so, and then it goes to the community and it goes to the world. And that was kind of like my little, you know, and I had a built-in, like, if my kids didn't like it, they tell me. that's like, well, no, it's, I don't think that's all that great. So, but with that in mind, and then I started meeting other artists. Um, and everybody's kind of younger than me, so... That's like, I don't know, just everybody's younger than me. So I started meeting other artists that were, that were younger than me, but they were like good at something that I couldn't do. And I was like, dang, I was like, how can, I want to do that, but I can't do that. But, so I, I can't beat them. I might as well join them. <laughs> this is my competition. Let's be friends. <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's show together. No, I mean, it's, I'm joking about it, of course, and he's got me on tape, but it's very Machiavellian, of course, right? 
But really, I mean, I really admired what these cats were doing, uh, these kids were doing, you know, males, females, women. I was like, men, they were, they were making this amazing work. And I was like, you know, and then people started calling me like, hey, can you bring um, your skate team over? Um, like, we got, and people don't know, like, I've done presentations at Harvard. I've done presentations at Princeton. I've done presentations at Brown. I've been all up and down the Ivy League, but people just think I'm a guy that lives on a dirt road in San Carlos. They don't know, I'm pretty qualified. <laughs> People don't, they think I just came off the street when they look at me. They don't know, I, you know, I kind of done this thing for a little bit. And so when they were inviting me, I would call my friends and I would say, hey, um, I'd call Yotica Fields, or I'd call Michael Wesley, or sometimes I'd call Rose Simpson at that time. Now I can't even get a call to, to them. <laughs> but at that time I said, hey, can you guys come paint? Can, let's do some live painting over there at uh, Princeton. And I always built them into the um, proposal. But that's how, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I think the way to work in a community is to involve a community, mm -hmm. to ask the community and not to be afraid. Because I see so many artists, quote unquote, my artistic peers. I'm just saying, just for sake of conversation, my peers are artists of my same age or whatever. But I actually say my peers, my artistic real peers are really aren't my same age, they're actually younger than me. But artists that are my age, I've seen them like just show with their friends, they show with their crew, their buddies. They don't wanna, they don't wanna let go of the prestige. Uh, so they wanna show with more prestigious artists, but I could care less about prestige. I wanted to show artists that were dope. I wanted to show artists that were killing it on many numerous levels. And I wasn't afraid, I was never afraid to show with artists that were better than me. Or, or whatever, and I was just fortunate that they were my friends, so they were gonna try to outdo me too. <laughs> but, but I don't know, I don't, I mean, to me to work in the community, you have to involve a community, and then over time, the other way we involve the community was like do films and putting it on YouTube and make, putting it on social media and then allowing people to interact and, and sharing that because we couldn't, only drawback for me for being an Apache skate, having Apache skateboard is I wanted to like sponsor and do so much for so many people, but it's such a small company, and people don't. People always like somebody interviewed me the other day from NPR, and they said, "So, um, so the tribe, how long is the tribe? And the tribe sponsors you, right? Like you've done all this stuff because your tribe has given you money to do this. That's what he said on from NPR." I was like, "No, a tribe didn't give me nothing. I when I sell art, that's how I." create Apache skateboards, I'll take the painting money and then order, buy skateboards or whatever, t-shirts or whatever. So like people assume like I'm like I'm sitting on some pile of money or something from the tribe or I don't know, but it's just, um, it's been me. It's been the work that I sell and make and so, and um, you know, and then life as an artist, you know, goes up and down and sometimes you sell and sometimes you don't, so, but um, I'm not going to complain, and I'm like, that's the life I chose. It's the life we chose. You know, it's like, it's like Don Corleone says, hey, that's the life we chose, man. <laughs> Can't complain. I'd rather do what I'm doing than hang on, dancing on a string like some puppet, he said, for a bunch of big shots. Because nobody tells us what to do. Any of people don't need permission from nobody to make anything. We don't need permission from nobody. We were here first. It's all our turf. You can make whatever you want. Yeah, you, if, yeah, and I say this now, if you're gonna sell out, go ahead, sell out big, but don't cry and complain when people call you out on it either. Do it big though, do it good, but be prepared for the criticism. Don't cry when you do, because that just comes with the territory. All I'm saying is, <laughs> you can, sometimes you can have it both ways, sometimes you can't, but either way, it doesn't matter. We can make whatever we want, because like I said, it's all our turf. It's we're here first. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> That's great. Um, I've always really enjoyed seeing what you've done throughout the years. I think it was about 10 years ago. And I really loved the, the idea of, of what you've done. I mean, obviously, you've always worked with some really amazing people. And you mentioned a couple of them just right off the bat. But um, and I've noticed this actually at the last Herd Indian Market, where there were a number of different folks who were actually putting together their own exhibitions outside of the market this time in Phoenix, which I think is very exciting, but this one was doing it, I think, what, 15, 10, 15 years ago, and um, was working with um, the downtown Phoenix community and, um, and was showing um, 
during Indian market, but not at the market, if that makes sense. And I thought that was a really uh, amazing thing to do, and he always is encouraged. It, it's, it's a great and a really wonderful thing, I think, that you've done and actually encouraged. And you can see that it's actually catching on now with a number of other folks who have been doing that down in places like Phoenix, which I think is a really, really a great thing. Any of you have any other things to say? I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm worried. <laughs> No, thank, thanks for saying that, you know, and, and um, art should be fun too, though. I mean, it, it, it has to be fun, and it should be fun. It's like he's using bikes, and that's fun for kids, and, um, you know, they're involving people and teaching them to bead, and that, I'm sure that's really fun for people that have never beaded, that, that are getting a chance to learn, and so that's really amazing what they're doing and what he's doing, and I think we're all doing um, extremely important things, and they're all equally important. So, um, like I said, it's, it's pretty humbling to be here, too, with them. Great. Well, with that said, we're going to go to Dylan. And uh, Dylan, um, your question is, how did uh, community participation co-inform the intentionality of your project, conceptually and aesthetically, and your choice of medium? So, I think for me, um, in my various collaborations and partnerships with, uh, with various individuals, most of my work is, is entirely collaborative from, I'm trained as a printmaker and collaborate as a member of a print clock uh, collective known as Just Seeds, um, to projects such as Anishina Ben Sabim Skoyab Shkigawak, Native Kids Ride Bikes. It's about collaborating. Um, and, and so for me, the bikes themselves aren't the works of art, but rather the things that, that I've taken from, from social practice is that the artworks are in those moments together, in those workshops, in those collaborations, and that the bikes become some sort of archival document of the actual artwork, of those moments of interacting, building relationships, learning, sharing, knowing one another, creating spaces weekly, um, and, and, and much of my practice, and I'll, I'll probably get around to answering this question like everyone else, we kind of talk around the, the questions and use them as... as, as it's like as a tribal council up. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Just not as long. Um, but one thing, for about two or three years, I worked with uh, two friends of mine, and we did a, a project called Bekwejong, uh, which uh, means where the rivers meet, and it was an oral history project working with, uh, with retired Anishinaabeg auto workers and kind of documenting the native history. And so we'd get together once a week with um, some of the old folks. We'd share coffee and, and, and cedar tea and scone and, and things like that, um, and just shoot the shit and have conversations. And occasionally, some important stories would be told. Some were recorded, some were not. But one of the things that, that I, I, I learned, one of the many things that I learned there was that kind of we used to create spaces when people would just stop by. You just stop by someone's house unannounced. But through the process of urbanization, through kind of the speed of, of many of our lives, right, um, these sorts of things fall to the wayside. Um, and, and so I, I thought, and I created the workshops initially as a way to just plan once a week to get together with a group of youth, bring in some elders, some kind of uh, young adults, as a way of just organizing these meeting times where we could shoot the shit and organize and, and, and talk and, 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 you know, do some things in the process. Um, and, and, and so for me, the, 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 the production and the, the, the intentionality was one that I had. I had ideas of what I wanted to do, right? And whenever you're kind of working and collaborating with partners, you have to be able to, you have to be open to, to pushing your own uh, ego aside and creating something new and creating something that's outside of what my expectations, what your expectations would have been. And especially, you know, you know with, the, with the seven uh, grandfather teachings, we'd, we'd met with elders and, and they'd learned, the youth had learned about the grandfather teachings in their language classes, and so it became this perfect metaphor and these, these perfect number of uh, bikes to make it fit with the youth. Um, and so I came in with that idea, but they brought all of these other elements to, to the table. And one of the bikes the kids had learned from, from one of the elders, uh, Grandma Rosie, how, to, how to, they had made uh, dream catchers. And I was like, oh, you're going <laughs> to put that on one of the bikes. And I was really, you know, I was really kind of like, oh, we can't use some of these 
uh, these, these tropes and these images that are reproduced, which, you know, I don't find, uh, I think are, you know, become stereotypical in some ways. But the youth were really excited about it because it's a practice that they had just learned, right? They had just learned it. One of the elders had taught them this. They were really excited because they could do it on their own. So they transformed one of the frame, the bike frames actually into a dream catcher. And they'd use some uh, sinew and put some beams, beads in it. And I mean, in the end, it ended up being a very interesting bike and it was very, very subtle because you couldn't see it from a distance. You had to get right up in it. Uh, you had to get right up there to see, to see the sinew itself and to see the beads on it. So that's one of those cases where I have some things as an artist, uh, as an activist, as someone who has perspectives and positions and tries to fight against certain things and was very uh, put off by that idea. But through kind of understanding that it's a give and take, um, was willing and allowed to, you know, when, when it happened, it became one of uh, a beautiful bike. And, and so I guess um, in these spaces, when we collaborate with youth, there has to be a shared uh, relationship and responsibility, um, things we bring in, but also things that they bring in. And in the end, right, it's, if it really is going to be about that process, about that meeting and working together, then it, I can't be so invested in specific ideas that I'm not willing to change them. And so, for instance, that project, the first time I did the bikes was the easiest because it's the community I live in, I know all the youth, I knew the elders, um, and I've done it various other times when, I, when I'll spend anywhere from, you know, uh, three days to a week or more, two weeks, um, uh, kind of working with youth to, to build bikes, and sometimes the ones I did in Vancouver, which are part of Beat Nation, were actually with kind of a young and emerging uh, urban Aboriginal artists uh, who were living in BC at the time. Um, and so, so sometimes, right, I have to be prepared to put all this stuff on the table if, if those ideas aren't flowing, and other times I just put shit out there and, and things organically develop. Um, some of my other projects, like this one, and I have some books, if, uh, I have about uh, eight, eight books if people want to grab them. Um, but this was the project that I did in, in Flint, Michigan, where I investigated the history of this, this, uh, this parcel that was part of, part of the Treaty of Saginaw. Um, I worked with a fluent uh, language speaker who, who translated all of the text, so it's in English and Nishinaabemowin text. I'd worked with uh, some other folks, worked with the, the land council who actually, the land bank, uh, who actually owns the land, um, because Flint, much like Detroit, has many uh, vacant parcels, and, and when they become vacant, the, this land bank takes them over and kind of helps keep them up, and so that this parcel was owned by the land bank and had been going into, uh, was being restored as a wetland. It's a former you know, a former factory site which, was, which had been decimated. And so I was working with all of these different levels of, uh, of individuals. Um, and with that, you have to be willing to, to give and take and let the process kind of organically grow. And I'm guessing your projects are very similar because you're working with right, all of these councils and all of these individuals just to get the exhibition from one site to the next. Yeah, it'll be interesting when, when it moves off Korean national territory because the protocols are very specific so that'll be that'll be interesting but yeah it's even just if there's nothing more overwhelming I mean I know people told me how much it was involved in installing it and then you're sitting in a room with 17 you know 30 boxes of vamps and you're like oh my god we don't have enough room try this plan try that plan like just and then everyone is problem solving that was, and then you get, um, and the, the volunteers have, they're so patient because you get them to put stuff down and then I'm standing there, right, doing my curatorial thing going, no, nah. no, everything, every green has to start over here, <laughs> and the black is, no, that's not working, and so they move them all again. And then someone else comes along and goes, yeah, no, we haven't got an, and so it's just like, not only do you have to lay them down once, but you must lay them down 10 times before you come up with the final, configuration and then it's then it was like for us it was like the last 10 minutes we were very lucky we had uh, well some of our volunteers we had uh, librarians a librarian from the municipal library in Winnipeg and then also the U of W librarian and they came up and they were like oh this is perfect for us detail right so they're fini they totally got into the finickety kind of stuff and then um, a couple of curators um, who were very patient sort of installing, but it was like, not, I was had a doubt whether it would even come together. I had a stretch of about six hours, we're like, oh my God, the 
this just isn't going to happen. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes, someone put a period, and bang, it just snapped. You're like, okay, we got it. That's amazing. Because when you're trying to mobilize, well, at minimum, five. And if you've only got five people on the floor, you're in trouble. And then sometimes as many as 20, trying to coordinate everything. So there was a story that uh, it keeps coming back to my mind that was uh, told to me by Wilfred Pelche. Wilfred Pelche, uh, he, the late Wilfred Pelche, was a, an Odawa elder from Wakwimakong. And I spent a lot of time with him, and he always used to repeat his stories so that they would think, sink, sink into my thick head, and I wouldn't forget them later. So I'm re grateful for that. One of the stories he told me was in his community, there, were, um, there was a prime minister, his name was Le uh, Pearson. Well, before he was prime minister, he was the MP for that region. He used to be going to Wiki all the time for dinners once a year, and the community would put together a great big dinner. And, and um, Wilfred's point was that uh, he, he wrote it in 72, and he said, Indian communities are highly organized, very complex, uh, have complex organizational structures, but you'll never be able to find a leader or uh, an organizer. He said, so whenever there was a, a dinner, uh, he said the person that made the turkeys made the turkey. The person that made the best pies showed up with the best pie. You never had to organize it or anything. And then when Pearson became prime minister, well then the prime minister's office became involved and they sent somebody down there to do the organizing. And that lady had 12 turkeys in, in the ovens all around the community and nobody, you know, because she was trying to dictate from the top down, a top down approach into a community that didn't operate that way. And it just was a disaster because nobody made pies and it was all complete chaos. <laughs> so I've always thought about that. That's always in my mind. And um, understanding that each of us have gifts and each of us can bring whatever we can and not asking, but just, like when you go to a, a ceremony or a lodge, everybody just gets to work. Nobody tells anybody what to do. You just see what needs to be done and you do it. So having the faith in community to know that every, that's how we operate, that's how we do it. People will show up and some people may show up and they may, you know, do something like, like these guys did in Edmonton, they brought some braids of sweetgrass. That was their contribution. It was great. Some people like Sherry oversaw five beating groups and you know did her two pairs of her own vamps and is on the National Collective and is working, you know, and, and it's whatever people bring, you just accept and, and, and you step back and you let it happen as the community without needing the organization from the top. And that's something that I've found that the more we sort of do that step back and let the communities where it's going do their own thing with a little bit of advice like you are going to need 12 people for 12 hours for four days to install just to let you know <laughs> you know stuff like that but um, but mostly it really is a community-based initiative once it gets to the community and they've already started organizing well in advance before the vamps even get there so it's it's interesting on so many levels to just watch it unfold and be whatever it is going to be without any kind of expectations. With that, though, when you have something invested in it, it, it allows for many sleepless at nights, freaking out that things aren't going to come together. That you, you, you have it, <laughs> you know, it has to be in X location in two days, and you know, none of it's done yet. Um, you know, when some of the practical elements of, of collaborating with community when you're just concerned that the, the very reality that the objects or the things aren't going to be done. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, I always theorize about, you know, what this means and how, you know, the process. Those bike, I got then, those bike parts for you when you were in Santa Fe. <laughs> and it did, did right? It, yeah. I didn't pick up one of the bikes, but we got the other ones done. We and, got some of Right, you know, um, it's... There's always that moment of, is anyone going to come? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, right now, we've got just a little bit of time for some um, questions from the audience. So, does anyone have any questions you would like to ask? America? Yeah, so she was asking about working in rural reserve communities, reservation communities versus urban uh, communities. Um, I've worked a little bit uh, with, uh, on reservation communities. Uh, you know, an hour north of where I live is the Saigon Chippewa. Uh, 
res, and they, through the Zeebwing Center, which is one of the kind of the premier uh, native cultural centers and museums, they have a, a very vibrant arts programming and exhibition uh, space. So I've worked through them, done workshops there. Um, but it's, it's usually been, I mean, for me, it's always been working, when I go somewhere, it's working with institutions that are already set in place. Um, and especially if it's a community that I'm not a, uh, I'm not a part of, and I think that's you know, uh, you know maybe your larger question is how do you institutionalize or how do you operationalize some of these sorts of projects in spaces in communities that don't have them and have absolutely no infrastructure from the, for them. I think that you know I mean, you know that's a, that's a, that's a larger question. Um, you know maybe one of the other panelists uh, could get to that. You know. That one, I'm not. I'm not exactly. I think. I think it, one. It would. It would have to to, to look at the, spe, uh, the 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 localized needs and 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 kind of structures that are already there, um, you know. But but working with 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 schools, I've worked with schools, and they you know have things in place. Um, whenever you're doing after school programming, programming, it's again. Is anyone going to show up? Oh, these this kid didn't come. You know, I have one kid for five straight weeks, and there's 37 kids. What, how do I even kind of make sense of this? Um, so there's the practical kind of day-to-day -day stuff, and then there's the how do you operationalize it. I did a lot. Of, I did a, uh, with the patch of skateboards. I did a, a lot of work in so-called rural communities, or what people might call res communities, almost exclusively, pretty much. And what we couldn't um, record, a lot of it is actually online on YouTube videos. I've been with the team as an artist, sometimes solo, and sometimes with the team. I've been invited four times by Navajo Nation, um, Chemehuevi Tribe, uh, Gila River Tribe, the Otham Tribes. And we go, um, we've been four times to a very remote community, which I guess you could call it rural, which is Red Lake Nation. <laughs> Uh, in Minnesota, which we helped them uh, visualize and eventually plan and build a skate park. And we have a documentary that's being completed on that. It's funny that she brought it up because pretty much the work of Apache Skateboards, now that she brought it up, has almost been, even though we've, I've done, you know, showed at Self Up Graphics and working in and around, you know, Phoenix area, but as a group, we've pretty much been invited by numerous uh, reservation communities. Um, and that's no small feat either because uh, we fly to that state, we fly to that little airstrip and we get picked up and we might sleep on a floor but we don't care. Um, my, my crew likes it when kids get stoked out when they're just out there skating and having a good time and we might do a mural, we might talk about skating, we might hold a skate event and so um, when we've been doing that um, literally for 10 years. Um, with no federal funding or state funding, but it's been tribal funding. So, um, and I always tell people, if you want us to come to your community, um, we do have like what I call the, the, the sliding scale fee, because we know some communities are better off than others. So, so for example, when we were invited by the community, the tribe that basically owns Palm Springs, we slid the scale pretty high. <laughs> Hey, what'd you expect? You know, what we're we gonna do? Like, so let's just say we were living pretty high off the hog that weekend. Wait, wait, shh, shh. Let me give you the mic. We have someone who is hard of hearing and it needs to go through the, yeah, it needs to go through the. I didn't think I'd get a mic, but did, did Red Lake fund the skateboard park? Uh, actually, did you get tribal actually funding? Actually, Red Lake appealed to another tribe. That's near Minnesota, but I can't remember the name of it right now. That's near Minneapolis. What is that tribe? They've got a really nice casino. Yeah, they appealed to Shakopee. They wrote a grant to Shakopee, and the Shakopees came in. And, and so I remember their, their tribal chairman was there. But, uh, and I think it was Shakopee money that flew us there numerous times and, and got us. But it's funny because, because um, like, if you tell, it, it's because we're talking about art projects, but it's art, but it's, kind of isn't, but it kind of is, it, but it kind of isn't. I mean, it's, it's not artsy, but it is artsy because my boys, <laughs> my boys on a skateboard recreate and reclaim space mm -hmm. all the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. That's their job. Mm -hmm. That space belongs to them when they're in it. That wall belongs to them, that hunky cement, that old log, they're recreating space. They spit and they're creating something. That's what we do. 
It may not be in a book, it may not be in a museum, but hey, we did a show here in 04 in this museum too, so. I mean, that's what we do, that's what they do. I mean, they're, I always say they're skaters, but they're kind of like martial artists. They're committed to their art form, they build up resistance to pain, they've been doing it for years, they do it on a daily basis, they teach younger, younger skaters. I mean, for me, they're it. They're it for me, but, and I think, <laughs> And I think that's what, that's just, that's what's been keeping me going all this time. It was like, they're it. I think the claiming space thing is something that we all have in common. You know, that it's about creating and claiming space in, in a whole variety of ways. Um, when I'm thinking of more uh, rural projects, the ones that come to mind for, in Canada are, have more, it seems to be that film projects and performance rather than visual arts projects, seems to have had a greater impact. Uh, the Bajamajig Theater, based on Manitoulin Island, travels all over. And the director was telling me that they go up into a community where the teaching, teaching staff turn over really quickly. And they said something to one of the kids like, oh, we'll be back. And then one of the kids said, no, you won't. No one ever comes back. So the experience of the, of the children was that people come into the community and they never come back. And that really stayed with him. And he's like, no, we'll be back. And his kids are just like, nah, you won't be back. And so then the whole time after, he's like, how are we going to get back? We've got to prove to these kids that people will be back. And so then they, they, first of all, went back to the community, but they also then established a mentorship program where some of the talented kids that they'd been working with up at the community were coming down to Manitoulin to be mentored and do internships with the Bodge there. Um, I can't remember the name of that film project, and I should know because I knew people who worked on it, but there was a little film project that would just kind of parachute into a community and work with youth to tell their stories and do short films. And they lost their funding at one point, and then this whole grassroots thing to get their funding maintained. So as far as I know, they're still going on. They're still, they're st and they've reached like dozens of small communities. And then small, small projects like Robin Brass, just one artist um, to, to sort of uh, turn kids on to traditional arts and traditional knowledge has been coming in by herself, identifying um, people with the knowledge and then getting a little group of students around her and they're learning, you know, hide tanning and basket making traditions that are endangered in those communities. So it is happening, but I think we're 60% urban based in Canada um, and a lot of us are there. Our population, I don't know if it's the same as yours, but I think 50% of our population is under the age of 25. If we're a very young population, a very urban population. That's exciting. And that said, the, uh, this project that we're doing, there's a lot of beating groups that were done on, on reserve and, um, and in Métis communities and in rural communities. Of, I, don't, I wouldn't classify any as being in remote communities, but definitely rural and fly-in communities. Um, and we don't take uh, any government funding, and that's a choice we haven't applied for, it, nor, we, nor do we take any, so we do everything through, through uh, fundraising and, and people's contributions. And what we do is we don't plan on going anywhere, we wait to be invited to go. So uh, in that situation, on, on the list of 30 locations that we're going to, um, we, we are going on, on res to um, Akwesasne, and to Ganawage. Uh, so far, uh, those are the only two communities on res who have invited us, but there are some smaller communities in the north that are primarily Métis First Nations communities who have invited us too, but they're not considered to be on reserve. So- Like it, the Paw? Like the Paw and Flim Flon. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, there's really a lot of variety. We're going to urban centers, but we're also going to these really small communities too. And, and, uh, and with working with people who are not really used to that and who have had a large, like where this issue has been really uh, hit them hard. And so it's, it's, it's good. It's, we're, we're just trying to um, accommodate people where, they, where, they, where they're at. Yeah. That's great. Um, and just as, oh, I was just going to say something before you raised your hand. Um, someone in the audience, um, Raven Cuchone, who's actually the resident composer for uh, um, a... Uh, 
project with children or with high school kids, I shouldn't say they're children, high school kids um, called the Native American um, Composer Apprentice Program that happens every year. They take kids from um, uh, Native nations um, around Arizona and, and hopefully New Mexico in the upcoming years. Um, and they work with Raven to compose um, pieces that then are presented at the Grand Canyon um, Music Festival with a, um, a, a professional quartet. It's one of the most amazing things you've ever seen. But with that said, I'm going to give one last question to Candace Hopkins. So here we go. Let me give you the mic. Excuse me. Hi. Uh, I had a question for Christy and, and Sherry. Um, I was really interested when you were speaking about the project uh, and how you were introducing what some people would consider to be uh, other ideologies to the presentation of the, of the vamps um, that are, I think, distinctly coming from uh, Métis and First Nations communities, and that is that, for one, you felt like you didn't want to transport the works through a fine art shipper. You wanted them to be transported personally because you're caring for these objects. And then each of the exhibitions has uh, someone who I think uh, Christy uh, called a keeper, and so they're driven locally by uh, protocols uh, and as they move to different communi communities those protocols also change and what I'm really intrigued by is that uh, being someone who works uh, with exhibitions in museums is what is um, and given so much care that's put uh, not only in the making of these objects but how how they're shown is what's the eventual um, where will they end up? Where, where will they end up in the end? What 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 are your plans for the collection now? We just asked ourselves that question a couple of days ago, um, and we don't know. Uh, some people want their vamps back. I have one pair that I made for a particular woman, and then during the family viewing of when they walked through, just by a series of coincidences, I ended up meeting her family and her daughter and being able to show the vamps that I made for her mom. And so after I thought, when, it, when they come down, I'm going to make moccasins for that girl, because by the time it comes down, she's going to be a certain age, right? So she might be ready to graduate high school. She might be starting to dance, and so that I would take the vamps I made for her mom and make moccasins for her. That was just a thought that after, because I, I feel like I'm, somehow I'm going to end up staying in touch with that family. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen with them. Hi, Candice. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I uh, gave tobacco to our elder, and I asked her uh, if she would take the next six years to consider uh, what needs to be done with the pairs that won't go back to people. Some people have specifically requested their pairs back. Others, uh, like me, I don't want them back. I'd, and I'm not comfortable with the idea of them being in some museum somewhere either. So she is going to consider it. She'll do what she needs to do through ceremony, and she'll come back to us and let us know what the solution will be for the rest of the pairs that are not sent back to people. But she has told us that the, that the exhibit will, has an end date. She said it's uh, eight years in total. So one year was creation, seven years of travel. And, um, and then the end ceremony is at her property in Saskatchewan by the Saskatchewan River and uh, that will be the final one. And then she said, and somebody else will come up with another great idea and they will do it too. So, you know, it's not that this needs to continue and continue, that this is a ceremony that will last for seven years and, and that will be the end. Yeah. Their last installation, they're gonna walk up a hill. Yeah, they're gonna be installed up a hill. Yeah. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming. So thank every one of you for coming here and joining us today. We've had such wonderful speakers and I want to thank you, Christy, thank you, thank you Sherry, thank you, Dylan, and thank you, Doug. And let's give a special hand to our moderator, Andrea, so thank you, let's give her a hand. <laughs>